right now we have a session with our brother i would like to say he's like a brother to us of the brahma kumaris um and formerly known as Professor Ram Mohan Rao, and I know he's probably cringing right now for me to introduce him that way. But for someone to um, pursue, uh, you know, the sciences, and um, I can only imagine what must have gone on in his life, and to get the credentials and the education um, to be a neuroscientist and also a consultant at the Buck Institute and he's done a lot of research and uh, written many reports and recently he's put out a, a book interestingly during this time of change and um, being sheltered in place and so this lovely book, Good Living Practices, and I think, I mean, it's so timely, and it's a beautiful, very well-written and um, uh, simple to follow and to get your uh, practices on developing that resilience, and not only spiritually, but also we need the help of a healthy mind and healthy body. And so today, um, Ram is going to guide us uh, with good living practices, uh, tools to surf the waves of change in these challenging times. Um, but also just a little bit about him, if I may add, um, not only does he have this uh, aspect of science in his resume, but his passion is actually in alternative healing and so he is uh, certified at the California College of Ayurvedic Medicine, and he teaches in their Nevada City location. He's also a dedicated Hatha Yoga practitioner, um, and Ram has published several articles uh, on yoga and Ayurveda. So uh, he's a member of the NAMA and a member of the AAPNA. I'm not sure of these acronyms, but um, he, he is quite, I would say, uh, the seeker of understanding the balance of these uh, aspects of body, mind, and emotions, and spirit. Uh, so please welcome Ram Rao. Om Shanti. Thank you, Sister Elizabeth. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Thank you so much, Sister Elizabeth, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you to all the sisters of Anubhuti for uh, providing this platform to us today. Uh, thanks to Sister Kyoto for that wonderful music. Sister Denise for facilitating the meditation in the morning. And of course, for that wonderful lecture that she gave on balance and resilience. And to Padma for uh, providing that uh, energy session where we could, uh, you know, move our energy um, throughout our body and mind. <clears throat> now, Sister Denise actually spoke about balance and resilience. And uh, the question is, where did we lose our balance and resilience? Right? Our world, the present day world, is besieged with the pandemic. There's a lot of civil unrest. A lot of wars are being fought inside our country, outside of the country, between countries, border wars. And in addition to all that, we have natural calamities. And no one is happy. The economy is tumbling. A lot of the businesses have closed. A lot of events have been canceled. A lot of health concerns. And in our own little lives, the changes that we have brought about in our daily routines have created a lot of fear, worry, anxiety, anger, rage, depression, and so many other mental turbulence. And it's just not us, it's across the globe, like never before. Everywhere there seems to be disease and suffering of some, concern, of some sort. Everyone is seeking answers to some of the most pertinent questions, but we are clueless and we're confused. Our minds are foggy 
and we have no clear answers. The one common question that keep, we, we, keep get, we keep getting asked is why should there be disease and suffering? And what is the cause of disease? It's a very fair question. And if you ask modern scientists, researchers, we say that diseases are caused by external agents like the viruses, the bacteria, the allergens, etc. But is this the actual cause? Because if this is the actual cause, then everyone should have got the disease, right? Not just a select few. On the other hand, if you look back at the Eastern medical sciences, uh, primarily Ayurveda and yoga, these texts actually talk about the three primary causes of diseases. And understanding these causes actually helps us to understand our own true nature and our relationship to others and the world at large. So with this background, let me share with you some slides where I can provide you detailed information as we dig deep into what disease is, what's the cause of disease, the ways to overcome it. And of course, I'll also talk about the body, mind and emotion nexus and will provide you some tips to strengthen some of these entities in order to promote health and wellness. So with that, let me start my slides here. All right. So you'll see my thumbnail sketch, but you'll see the slides that I have here. Screen. Okay, so as I was talking, both Ayurveda and yoga actually describe three primary causes of diseases. All right, and let's let's see if this makes sense. Because understanding these causes actually helps us to understand our own true nature and our relationship to others and the world. So Ayurveda and yoga talk about these three causes. Asat Mendriyata Sam Yoga. Okay, it's a mouthful, but think about it as misuse of the senses. The second cause is Pragna Parad, or failure of the intellect or the failure of the, the wisdom. And the third cause is Parinam or transformation. All right, so let's look at this individually. Asat Mendriyata Sam Yoga is nothing but it's a misuse of your senses, okay, with the objects. Now we have five senses, all right, and five sensory organs to perceive these senses. So it's the sight, of, uh, the, the faculty of hearing, seeing, taste, smell, and touch. And we have five sensory organs that perceive these five sensations. The question is, because these serve as a gateway, these are the five gateways, the five portals through which we bring hormone, through which we bring impressions from external sources. The question is, are you bringing in harmonious impressions or are you bringing in disharmonious impressions through your sense of sound, touch, sight, taste, and smell? If you're bringing harmonious impressions, then you have optimal health. If on the other hand, you bring in disharmonious impressions through these five portals or five gateways, you become susceptible to disease. And it seems or it appears that it's a disharmonious impression that we are bringing in because it's superseding our over harmony through our five senses. We seek only pleasures and through our five senses, we try to fulfill all our unlimited desires and wants. And if these go unfulfilled, what happens is we get frustrated. Okay. And then the negativity to, takes over. This negativity then weakens the mind and the body. And it results in poor health, disease and suffering. 
The second cause of disease is pragna parad. Pragna actually means wisdom and aparada means offense. So it sounds like it's a failure of the intellect. And now let's, let's not bother about defining intellect here. Think about it as the inner voice. Okay, there's all of us have it. It always comes up. It tells us what is right and what is wrong. The question is, do we listen to it? Okay. The inner voice knows what is true. The question is, do we hear it? Because invariably we fail to listen to our inner voice. And as a result of which we partake in unhealthy behavior, in spite of the fact that we know we will not feel optimal afterwards. So when our senses lead us astray, our inner voice tells us that we are going in the wrong direction. It tries to lead us to harmony. The question is, do we listen to it? Either we ignore it or we are oblivious to it. And the end result is disease and suffering. The third cause of disease is Parinama. I like to define it as transformation. Transformation happens on an everyday basis. Okay, it's a decay. And the decay comes about as a result of time and age. So there are two kinds of transformation that happens. The first happens because of chronological aging. And there's nothing we can do about it, right? Seconds turn into minutes. Minutes turn into hours. Hours turn into days and nights, which turn into weeks. Weeks turn into a month. And then the months turn into a year. Happy birthday. You're older by one year. And there's nothing we can do to stop it. It happens whether we like it or not. On the other hand, there's another aspect of transformation or parinam that's which I like to refer to as biological or cellular aging. And this biological or cellular aging actually refers to an individual's development based on certain cellular or molecular parameters. We are looking at the individuals as they are and as they function and not when they are born. So biological aging actually is a set of processes that triggers deterioration of health and ultimately death as a function of chronological aging. Biological aging is actually impacted at three levels. Emotions through negativity, mind through mental stress, and body through faulty physical routines and physical stress. Too much negativity, constantly engaging in mental stressful activities, faulty physical routines and physical stress, physical stress will all result in rapid transformation. This accelerated tissue aging. This will lower the immunity both in the mind and in the body, resulting in morbidity or diseases and suffering. So what happens is we get caught up in life's daily dramas. Think about this and think whether this has happened to you. We get caught up in life's daily dramas. We perform all those actions that give us pleasure. And as this continues, we become more desirous. And as we try to fulfill those desires, we become attached to all those actions. And in the course of time, we start making incorrect choices. And as we make more of these incorrect choices, disharmony sets in because we're trying to absorb everything through the five senses. So disharmony sets in. And when disharmony sets in, there's a breakdown of the physical, mental, and emotional nexus. And this then spirals into a loop of negativity, mental disturbance, and physical instability. This results in disease and suffering. So understanding the three causes is actually paramount for optimal health. Now clearly, all of us want to live healthy. We all want to be happy and we all want to have a longer life. The question is why as a society are we not achieving these goals? And the biggest problem is this. All these so-called health and wellness programs that are out there are incomplete. 
they are missing vital components. For example, now books on diet will tend to emphasize only on food and they do not talk about physical, mental exercise or they don't talk about emotions. Programs on physical exercise will usually focus on the benefits and techniques of exercises without describing what is needed to eat and how to address our emotional status. Similarly, any advice on emotions provides tips and interventions, but they do not typically integrate physical practices. So what happens is disease, poor health and suffering primarily arise when the emotions, the mind and the body are out of alignment and they function independently of each other. In other words, if you only focus on your body and pay very little attention to your mind or emotions, you are inviting ill health and suffering. For instance, let's say you're reading a book about, you know, how to maintain, a, a, how to practice a good diet or how to maintain a good diet. If you read the book and follow it, yes, you may have done a good job, an excellent job in improving your health status, maybe your weight, maybe your blood pressure, maybe your cholesterol levels. But the question is, if you do that without engaging in physical exercise, or if your mind is all, if your mind is always filled with emotional turbulence or negativity, or you find yourself sitting in front of the television every night with very little physical activity, what happens is in many cases you have addressed only a fraction of yourself. I call this a fractionated life, and leading a fractionated life actually promotes rapid biological aging. So what I'm trying to tell you is that when you define yourself as a human, or if you say that, if you say I am such and such person, or you are such and such person, we or I or you, we are actually a combination of all three aspects of individuality. And that's the body, the physical aspects, the mind, the mental aspects, and you can consider emotions, intellect, you know, it's a loose, it's a loose term, but for now let's consider it as emotions. So while these three facets appear as independent entities, it's a limiting belief that it's an independent entity. And that limiting belief is a root cause of suffering and disease. Instead, if we believe that we are a combination of all three aspects of individuality, body, mind, and emotions, and act accordingly, okay, wherein our senses bring in harmonious impressions, we can clearly listen to the inner voice, all these will result in delaying the biological aging or transformation by right now. This then leads to a harmonious life with significant increased protection from illness and disease. All right. So then the question is then, how do we keep these three entities, body, mind, and emotions in sync for optimal health and living? So when we talk about these three entities, we need to consider at the level of intellect or emotions, the tools that I like to talk about is mindfulness, meditation, and Sister Denise and Sister Elizabeth both provided us uh, a purview of what meditation looks like. Along with that, you need to have a good conduct and you need to overcome negativity. At the level of mind, I like to consider it as, as brain as well because the brain, I like to consider here the subtle aspect of the mind. Or the mind is a subtle aspect of the brain. The other way around. All right. So when we consider about, when we talk about brain or the mind, Think about sleep, selfless service, in Raja Yoga we call it seva, and mental exercise. And in the physical body, we bring in optimal digestion or good eating practices, good oral hygiene or hygiene in general, and physical exercise. All right, so let's go deeply into some of these topics. So as Sister Denise alluded, good emotional practices actually involves using suitable tools to perceive, understand, control, evaluate, and express emotions. 
what happens is this enables us to be aware of life's daily dramas. It helps to control our emotional upheavals. And it allows us to act effortlessly to experience complete joy and peace. And one of the tools that encompass good emotional practice is meditation or stillness. Now, there are many types and forms of meditation. And the benefits are manifold. There are hundreds of evidence-based studies to show what happens to the mind, to the emotions, and to the body. Benefits when we meditate. The problem is, a lot of people, when they think of meditation, they are a little scared. And the reason is because meditation conjures in their mind something about a person to have, to have shaved their head, to wear orange robes, and to be sitting in a corner, all right, away from the mainstream life. That is one section of meditators. But in your day-to-day -day practice, you don't have to shave your head. You don't have to wear orange robes. You don't have to sit in the corner. Every activity that you do, starting from the time that you get up in the morning till the time you go to bed in the night, every activity that you do, you can include meditation in that. You can include that as a meditative act. The reason is meditation actually encompasses three tools, undivided attention, focus, and awareness. And you may not realize, but these three aspects attention, focus, and awareness were with you. Imagine the time when you first appeared for your exams or for your first job interview. Or if there's some music musician like uh, Sister Kyoto, think about the time when you're playing a music, a musical instrument. Or think about the time when you're, when you're drawing or painting. In all these activities, there was an undivided attention, there was a focus and there was awareness. That is meditation. In yogic meditation, we don't involve ourselves in any activity. All we do is we focus on our breath. So our attention, our focus, and our awareness is on the breath. So whatever activity you do, if you bring in meditation into that act, it brings about feelings of fulfillment, achievement. It strengthens all the systems, body, mind, and emotions, and thereby promotes optimal health and wellness. And as I mentioned here in the slide, cooking can be a meditative act. Eating, which I'll talk about uh, as my last slide, is, can be a meditative act. Physical exercise can be a meditative act. When you're in your office, when you're indulging in some kind of, kind of a work, the question is, where is your mind and where are your emotions? If you put in all that into your work, that is meditation. So any form of meditation that has your attention focus and awareness is beneficial and as i mentioned cooking and eating are it has to be done consciously because they are acts of meditation and we'll practice that as a tool now when we talk about good emotional practices we also need to consider this negativity sister denise actually uh, mentioned that as well in her talk Negative emotions have to be considered because negative emotions are actually obstacles that prevent us from leading a peaceful life. And I've mentioned in the slide few of the negative emotions. And the reason I mentioned this is because in my book, I've talked about these emotions, these negative emotions. I call it, uh, um, you know, emotions that, that provide, that, that impinge your journey. And the reason I mentioned these emotions is because we have evidence-based studies to support the problems that these emotions can create in your mind and body. So emotions like anger, addiction, anxiety, fear, worry, depression, greed, all these, they act like a slow poison. They lower your mental and physical immunity and they make you susceptible to diseases, cancer, degenerative diseases. And these negative emotions, they destabilize the body, mind, and emotion nexus. They exhaust the mental and physical energy levels. They lower the levels of what we call feel-good neurochemicals and feel-good hormones. And this results in repeated 
pain, suffering, dissatisfaction, delusion. And over time, it can actually wreck an individual. So overcoming these deterrents, as I mentioned in my book, overcoming these deterrents is the key to living a peaceful, fulfilled life at all three levels, body, mind, and emotions. On the other hand, having a good conduct comes from cultivating positive emotions. And that includes, as I mentioned here in the slide, contentment, honesty, forgiveness, nonviolence, loving kindness. There are hundreds of studies that show that practicing these virtues helps to welcome desirable thoughts that fetch unlimited happiness, satisfaction, clarity, and joy. These positive emotions provide immense physical and mental benefits, and it's also a key predictor in leading a happy and healthy life. Some of these virtues, like forgiveness and loving kindness, can actually be practiced as a meditation because it encompasses feelings of affection, warm heartedness, and sympathy. So, the way you do this, and the way you know, Padma and I do it, and then when we teach our students what we do is, when we sit to meditate, we focus and direct our attention to the receivers, to all those who need that energy, the subtle energy. And then we say we provide forgiveness or we provide loving kindness. This can be done to anybody who needs it. Parents, siblings, friends, teachers, even your pets, anyone who needs support. And as you direct this forgiveness or the loving, loving kindness, intend that that positive energy will be sustained. So it gives the receiver everlasting peace, good health, and wellness. And in turn, it brings about those same positive changes to you as well because you are the doer. So to live harmoniously, you must practice these virtues at all levels through your thoughts, your actions, and words. This not only creates integrity and harmony for yourself, it also provides a platform for an honest and open communication with everybody else. By practicing these virtues, you will not only enjoy enhanced mental and physical well-being, but also provides a fulfilling and meaningful, meaningful life. Now, what about good mental practices? At the level of the mind, Good mental practices involves reinforcing the structural and functional aspects of the brain. And this can be achieved through mental exercise. Mental exercise, mental games, mental activity, all these are terms, but they all mean the same. And it, it is to keep the brain active. What happens is whenever you activate the brain, whenever you keep your brain active, the neurons, which are the cellular structures in the brain, they sprout out like the branches of a tree. So the more branches you have from the neurons, the more resilient you are. The more strengthened is your brain and the more stable you are physically. So the more the branches, the greater is the brain strength, the stronger is the mind. This phenomenon is called neuroplasticity. And neuroplasticity is a key to optimal health and wellness. You can engage in several activities in order to strengthen the brain and thereby the mind. Reading, learning a new musical instrument, being or turning, right, trying to do some kind of a paint or an art job, learning a new language, engaging in, in mathematical puzzles or you know, things like Sudoku, or playing a bridge game of bridge. All these are uh, activities that require for the brain to be strengthened, okay? It strength, strength, stimulates and strengthens the brain. The more the new tasks that you take on, the better is the brain. So now what happens is now we can, you can combine your physical exercise and mental exercise as well. So for example, now let's say you're taking a walk. That is a physical exercise. So when you're taking a walk, where is your mind? Has it wandered? Is it bringing in a lot of dramas? Instead, while engaging in a physical exercise, see if you can look around you. Say, you know, look at the road signs, 
the lanes, the by lanes, the avenues, the billboards, try to memorize those and try to recall them a one hour later or maybe a few hours later. So now you see how you're trying to bring in your physical exercise as, as well as mental activity together. So that's what I mean by bringing in the body and mind together. All right. Now, another aspect of mental intervention is through a good quality sleep. A good quality sleep is paramount to an optimal functioning brain. Poor sleep, abbreviated sleep, disturbed sleep, a prolonged lack of sleep. These are all damaging to the brain and to the mind and to the physical health as well. There are numerous studies that show what happens when you have a good quality sleep. An undisturbed good quality sleep allows the brain to clear out harmful toxins. It improves the cerebral blood flow. It's what makes you think much clearer as opposed to a foggy mind when you wake up in the morning. Sleep actually also allows you to erase all the unwanted extraneous things that you brought in the previous day. This process actually helps the neurons to communicate easily. In addition to psychological health and well being, good quality sleep actually serves as an antidote to several negative emotions. Sister Denise talked about fear. And there are now several uh, evidence-based studies to show that fear, worry, anxiety, anger, all these emotions can be overcome partly through good quality sleep. Because what happens is when you sleep, when you have a good quality sleep, it actually erases out all these negative emotions so you don't need to harbor in those emotions as well. Now, good quality sleep strengthens your emotions, it strengthens your mind, and it stabilizes your physical health. As a result of which, now your mind is clear, you can then decide what kind of impressions you want to bring in through your five senses. So you bring in only healthy impressions. It also enables you to listen to your inner voice. As a result of all this, Good quality sleep slows down biological aging, Parinama. One of the other acts of mental practice is engaging in selfless service. Selfless service or seva reinforces both the body and the mind. People who incorporate selfless service into their daily lives actually strengthen their ability to resist the impulses that comes from, through your ego. And these are the people, if you notice, they have achieved greater fulfillment and happiness. By performing selfless service, you're inspired to do the right things. You're less impulsive and you're not driven to act on knee-jerk or selfish urges. Selfless service, actually, if you do it with a pure devotion, that actually is an, another meditative act. When you do it with that meditative act, you are contributing to your psychological health and well-being. Selfless service strengthens your emotions, it strengthens your mind, it stabilizes your physical health and improves the overall quality of life. It improves the immunity at the level of mind and the physical health as well. Selfless service doesn't mean writing a check and mailing it. Okay. Selfless service is much better if you actually strive for it, if you make an effort towards it. So getting up, going, stepping out, maybe if you're feeding somebody, preparing some fresh food or buying some fresh food and then going and feeding those people. Okay, that to me is actually a better case of selfless service rather than writing a check and mailing it. Both are good, but this one is much better because you are you are engaging your body, you are engaging your mind, and you are engaging your emotions as well. When you actually do it yourself, when you when events bound with action, selfless service, and there are evidence-based studies to support this as well. It allows you to draw healthy impressions to the five senses, and again, when you engage in selfless service, you are listening to your inner voice. 
And all this then results in slowing down the biological aging transformation, Parinama. And guess what? In this situation of the pandemic, there are so many avenues that can engage in selfless service. And we hear of so many people doing all kinds of selfless services. In my book, I've written a bunch of things that you can do, acts of selfless service. What about the physical interventions? <clears throat> physical interventions actually involves, at the level of the body, it involves good eating practices, good physical exercises, and hygiene. When you incorporate good physical practices into your routine, you will feel more optimistic about your life choices. It improves your energy, it strengthens your body, it strengthens your mind, and your emotions are neutral. And it provides an opportunity for you to enjoy your life. When we talk about physical, uh, when you talk about body, we have to consider diet. And the reason being that that's one activity which we, we fail not we fail not to do we always do it right if not two times at least if not three times at least twice a day that we eat some of us eat four times some of us eat three times that's one activity which we'll always do we'll never forget doing it so think about it now if you imagine if you're eating three times a day that's the major activity that you're doing in your life and through those actions of eating, you're bringing in energy. So the question is, what kind of energy are you bringing in? Is it high quality energy or is it poor quality energy? Because ultimately it's about building immunity at the level of body and mind, okay? And building stability at the level of body and mind. So, your guide or your key to optimal health and wellness begins at kitchen at the level of the kitchen the kitchen is not any room it's to be considered as one of the holiest of all the rooms if you have an altar then of course that room becomes another holy place but the kitchen is what is i consider as the most holiest of places because that's where you're building your life that's where you're building yourself. And when you define yourself as I am so and so, it's because of the energy that comes from the kitchen where you prepare your food. And when you consider yourself as I or you, we are or I am what, when, how, where, and why we eat. The what becomes very important because it's about, all about nourishing yourself. So what are you eating? High quality, unprocessed, organic, freshly prepared food that has an optimal serving of carbs, proteins, fats, veggies, fruits, and nuts. When do you eat? Timing is extremely important. We have published a lot of work on this. Others have published a lot of work on this. Excuse me. There's a lot of evidence-based studies to show why timing of the food is very important. If you're concerned about body weight, if you're concerned about hypertension, if you're concerned about obesity, if you're concerned about uh, mental fog, all this can be reversed if you have your meals at the proper time. And I've explained in my book all these aspects. What's the proper time? What's the optimal time to eat your food? Basically, lunch somewhere between 11 and 1 p.m. Supper to coincide with the setting sun. Keep a gentle overnight fast of 12 hours between dinner and the next day's breakfast. The 12 hours minimum is, is required for the brain to function well, for the mind to be strengthened, and for your emotions to be neutral. How do you eat your food is another very important aspect. 
Are you paying attention to what you're eating? Is your mind focused on what you're eating? Do you have the awareness? Or are you eating physically, but your mind is elsewhere and you're very angry? So imagine that. Imagine the situation where you have your plate of food in front of you, all right? But your mind is thinking about the office and you're talking about, and you're thinking about another colleague, okay, who, is, who, who may have misbehaved with you. So now you're very angry. And in that mode of anger or emotional negativity, you're eating your food. It doesn't matter. Even if you're eating a high quality, unprocessed, organic food, that food will not help you if your mind is elsewhere and if you're bringing in emotions. So pay attention. Your mind, your emotions will need to be balanced. And you have to be focused and aware, and you have to be aware of what you're eating. There should be absolutely no disturbance. The body, mind, and emotions are all on the food. Where you eat, that's another important thing. I still remember when I first came to this country, this was like 24 years ago. Then and even now, we have a a situation in our, in our uh, scientific uh, environment wherein we have meetings during lunch hour and we call it the brown bag lunch meetings why brown bag because that's where we bring your sandwich and you bring your apple and you have a, a, a bowl of yogurt and they say we are eating a high quality freshly prepared food no doubt but the thing is you are neither paying attention to the speaker nor are you aware of what you're eating you're chewing on the apple, you're biting on the sandwich, you're blowing your nose, and if it happens to be a salsa, a hot salsa, you're sweating, you're neither paying attention to the speaker, nor are you aware of what you're eating. So those kind of lunch meetings should be totally, either you should be abolished, or you know, you should, if, if it's okay for you as a manager or something, or if you can speak to a manager, don't try to eat your meals when you uh, when you have a meeting. So you have to be very careful and attentive as to where you exactly you're eating. All right, so be conscious of that. And that should eating should be the sole activity. You should not combine any activities with eating. Chewing your food is another very important thing. And there are a lot of studies now to show that if you chew your food properly, you can actually lose weight. For people who are very conscious about weight, this is another, this is a very good method, chewing your food. And as a neuroscientist, I've, 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 we have seen papers where they talk about Alzheimer's disease or memory loss that comes in those patients who actually do not chew their food. You may wonder how a physical activity is linked to the brain. I have provided that connection in the, in the book. Just read that. So chewing your food is extremely important. Try to avoid snacks, follow your meal timings, keep gaps, at least a three minute, a three hour gap. And then why do you eat? I know the common question is I live to eat or I, I love to eat, whatever be it. But it's just not about living long. It's using that food's energy to actively pursue a worthy goal that benefits society. Because if you do that, then you'll find great meaning in your existence and you have a reason for living. And of course, along with good eating practices, you have to combine it with physical exercise as well. Physical exercise is a secret to remaining physically strong and active. You have to make exercise as part of your life. There are numerous benefits, hundreds and hundreds of evidence-based studies to show that physical exercise helps in weight loss. Physical exercise actually improves your sleep. So for people who have a lot of trouble sleeping, maybe that's the thing that you should consider, a physical exercise regimen. And by the way, phys physical exercise doesn't mean hitting the gym and you know doing all those weight things or trying to have those six abs or 12 abs. It's not about that. Physical exercise is actually, you can engage that in the form of either walking, gardening is a very good physical exercise, 
Swimming is a very good physical exercise. But remember one thing, when you are engaged in a physical exercise, please make sure that your mind is paying attention to what you're doing. Your mind is focused on that physical exercise. Make sure that your emotions are balanced. I see no reason in doing a physical activity while you're angry or while you're depressed. It doesn't help. It doesn't help because the emotions are not in place. It doesn't help because the emotions, mind and, phys and the physical body are totally not, not connected, disconnected, completely disconnected. So do not engage in physical exercise if your mind is not in the place. The reason why you engage in physical exercise is because you want to improve your immune strength, both at the level of the body and at the level of the mind. You want to increase your cerebral blood flow. You know, the transformation that happens in all of us, the biological aging that happens in all of us, the chronological aging that happens in all of us. As we age, the amount of blood that flows into the brain actually starts decreasing. Cerebral blood flow. And unfortunately, we don't have a medicine out there to increase the cerebral blood flow. There is no medicine. So the only way to improve cerebral blood flow is to engage in physical exercise, to have a good, of course, to have a good meal, timely meal, to engage in physical exercise. But at the same time, your mind should be on that as well. So for example, now grounding is another very important exercise that I normally recommend to a lot of my patients, especially in the San Francisco Bay Area. We have this beautiful beach. All right, so grounding refers to your physical contact with the earth. It could be the sand, it could be the mud in the garden, it could be the soil in the farm, anywhere, wherever there's a physical contact with earth, that's grounding. Grounding is very important, my friends. You know, in our setting where we work with uh, people with memory loss, Alzheimer's disease, we actually, one of the things that we do is, in addition to yoga and meditation, in the morning, we actually tell them to take a walk around the resort where we bring them, you know, we bring all these patients to a resort center and we put them in this four to five days of, um, you know, therapeutic interventions. And one of the things we do is we tell them to ground themselves. So they take a 15 to 20 minutes walk in the neighborhood with their bare foot. So that's a very important exercise. Physical exercise is very, very useful because it improves the blood flow. It erases negativity. It promotes positive thoughts and it improves neuronal branching. So a lot of things to consider when it comes to the body, mind and emotion nexus. Think about it. The next time you engage in an activity, whether it is eating, whether it is physical exercise, whether it's drinking, whether it's a mental exercise, before you engage in the activity, think about where is my body, where is my mind, and what's the status of my emotions. Think about all these things before you engage in that act. If your emotions are are uh, not balanced, if there's a lot of negativity, if you have just recovered from a flight or fright response, then just calm down. Calm down for a few minutes. I mean, it took me less than three minutes to stabilize myself when I started hearing the Sister Denise when she went through the guided meditation. It takes just two to three minutes to stabilize yourself. The mind is stabilized, the emotions are no longer there, it's neutral, and you are stable at a physical body level as well. So, so many, I mean, these are all very simple and doable things that you can do, that you can incorporate in your own life. We, we are not, and notice that in all these cases, we are not engaging in any kind of intervention that involves pills or medicines. Okay. 
because what happens is it's very easy a lot of people they don't want to take that effort they think this takes a lot of time and so they want they want the quick fix and they want to pill my friends if you you if you're taking a pill for a certain condition please do it you have to take the pill of course but remember in when you're taking the pill itself the question is where is your body where is your mind and where is your emotions in my practice when patients come to me and they tell me that they are taking medications either for hypertension or for diabetes or for some neurodegenerative condition i don't pull them off the drug i tell them do the drug the problem is they come to me because they are seeing a lot of a lot of side effects from the drug so what i tell them is i tell them to engage in these practices so good eating practices will improve their digestion good mental practices will make sure that their mind is in place along with the body and good emotional practices helps them to overcome negativity and to engage in selfless service so what happens is when they bring in all the interventions they can continue taking their pill the side effects of the pill is minimized why because your immune strength is is enhanced when you're doing all these practices so simple but very powerful and doable tips starts from your kitchen and ends with the bedroom good quality sleep so let me conclude here by saying that some of the simple tools that you can use to serve to these challenging times is number 1 eating a wholesome nutritious freshly cooked warm meal that has a lot of vegetables spices and whole grains eating is a meditative act so please be attentive while you're eating your food chew each bite at least 25 to 30 times before swallowing what happens is when you have to count for 25 to 30 times when you have to count naturally your mind can be elsewhere your mind has to be on the food your mind has to be on the count so this is a nice way of bringing in your mental activity on your on your on your, on the eating practice you're counting while you're chewing so that count allows your undivided attention to your eating it allows you to eat mindfully with your focus on the food keep at least a 3 hour gap between two meals you can snack if you wish to but make sure that between two meals there's at least a 3 hour gap resist eating uh, after your last meal of the day do your best to give at least a 12 hour gap between your dinner and breakfast a 30 minutes to 1 hour workout the workout could be physical exercise it could be yoga it could be swimming it could be cycling anything you can incorporate that either in the morning or in the afternoon please just don't stop there please don't engage in good eating practices and stop right at that you have to engage in good mental practices and when i talk about mental practices make sure that you are doing your mental exercises make sure that you are engaged in some kind of a selfless service in the afternoon padma is going to talk about when she's going to talk about pranic healing one of the things that they do in pranic healing is teething it's extending your hand to bring down the suffering imagine if all of us engage ourselves in some selfless service sacrificing our time and effort in in in, in performing the selfless service the world will definitely be a better place you don't have to shell out all your savings even a dollar that you can give to a a person who is in need helps in some way now when we talk about selfless service please remember one thing selfless service is not about announcing to the world that you have done that service okay it's doing it quietly you are not looking for the results you're not measuring the outcome 
you're not looking for the rewards or the awards. You're not looking for people coming to you and saying, you have done such a wonderful service. You're not out there looking for the fame that comes through media. Because all those, if you, if you, if you want all those, that's a desire. And in the first slide, I told you what happens when you have desires and when your desires go unfulfilled. Pragna Parad. Failure of the wisdom or failure of the intellect. So selfless service is something where you do it. Don't worry about the results. Don't worry about the outcome. Once you finish it, once you finish your selfless act, just turn around and keep doing some other job. A lot of people have come to me and said, why should I pay or why should I give a dollar to that homeless person when he or she has used the dollar to smoke or do a drug or something? Don't worry about that. Your selfless service was to provide a dollar. Don't worry about the outcome. Let the other person worry about what they want to do with that dollar. Okay. Go that extra mile, sacrifice your time and effort, then that selfless service will become a rewarding experience for you. And of course, make sure that you have at least 30 minutes of mental exercise. And as I, 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 told, I already told you about mental exercise, these days because of the pandemic, the gym is closed, I'm not able to hold my yoga classes. So what I do is I, I take a walk around the neighborhood. It takes, it's about 45 minutes walk. And when I go for a walk, I make sure to watch all the neighborhood allies, the avenues, the, the, the lanes. I try to memorize that. And when I come back home, I try to recall those names after one hour, after six hours. And next day morning, when I go for my walk again, before that road or avenue, I try to recall to see what, what exactly is that. So that way now I'm becoming more conscious of my walk. I'm not allowing my mind to wander around. I'm combining my physical exercise with my mental activity as well. Now it's just not about mental exercise. You have to cultivate positive emotions and overcome negativity. In Ayurveda, we say faith, F-A-I-T-H. Faith is the antidote to all the negative emotions. So can you cultivate faith? And then, of course, nourish all the positive emotions that I've talked about, which has an everlasting effect on your optimal health and wellness. So with that, my dear friends, thank you very much. I hope you had an entertaining uh, talk. I hope you were able to inculcate a lot of these uh, things that I brought about. And if you can practice them, if you can inculcate them, if you can bring them into your own body, mind and emotions, that will be awesome. Okay, that will provide you a lot of the tools to surf through these untiring, disturbing, trying times. All right. And then gone will be the question as to why I'm suffering or why I'm having this disease. Because there's no question of having any disease in the first place if you do all these things. All right. So thank you, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening. And for those in the Pacific Zone, have a good lunch. Namaste.